All right. Well, I know cruft is your favorite word, as you told me, right? <laughs> Joe's favorite word. Uh, no, it's not, but he thought it was a neat word. Um, actually, the other day, a client used another word, uh, detritus, that I thought was interesting. I hope he wasn't referring to me. I'm sure he was referring to a plug-in, but <laughs> there are some interesting words you could use for database cleanup, that's for sure. Um, so yeah, this presentation is about uh, cleaning up your WordPress slash WooCommerce database. Uh, and I'll tell you a quick story just to kind of set the stage for uh, what, what this really could be in, with regards to a lot of things, mostly site performance, but I'd like to give one example that I think might resonate. So is audio good? Is everybody seeing it? Uh, everything's looking okay right now? I don't hear anything, so that's worrying. I can see. All right. Yeah, we're good. We're, we're good. good. I okay. see in here. Excellent. All good. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. So one quick story. So uh, a relatively new client came in, what, about a couple months ago, and she was having troubles with her host. She had just upgraded their plan from what I think was a $35 a month plan to a $100 a month plan. So it was a fairly serious hosting plan. Not huge in the world of hosting costs because they could range way up into the thousands per month but definitely not tiny either. $100 a month is considerable. Um, and she was getting orders about every minute. Uh, she didn't actually tell me that. I, I got the log into her site and I looked and said, whoa, <laughs> there's orders flying in right as I'm looking at, I keep refreshing the page and there's more, what's going on? So uh, that creates a, a bit of a data problem when you're getting frequent data coming in. And we're not just talking orders, we're talking, she sells digital downloads. So we're talking download permission records, user records. You have to have a user account in order to download and access your downloads. Those files can change over time. So she has to regenerate download permissions. So it is a fair amount of data. And I looked at it a little more closely and realized that two thirds of these orders were not charged. They were like free giveaways. So her business is doing good, but two thirds of that is just data, 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 and that costs and there's no income for it. So I said, well, there's really a couple ways you could go with that. And first I thought I would open this up to the group for a second to see uh, what, what ideas people have on this. Cause there's a couple solutions I'll mention here, but let me open it up. Does anybody want to pitch in an idea of what you could do to deal with a fairly large amount of order volume? piling up in your database. Just chime in if anybody wants to. I mean, I wish I had that problem, but. <laughs> mm -hmm. It can happen sooner than you think. Actually, uh, actually, I have a large store, I just didn't attend the chat, but I have a large store that actually, uh, where actually the host actually told me about like the lean orders from the database to make it leaner, but I don't mm -hmm. know if it's the right direction or not. Right. Yeah, because you're in a situation where you want to keep taking orders and you like having order history, but at the same time, uh, you're just building and building and building and the, those host, hosting costs are going to really jump up. Her next level up was 250 a month and she actually did opt for that. Um, and the reason why she had to, as I discovered, is this particular host, I won't name names, but this particular host, the $99 a month plan only gave you a four gigabyte RAM access. And uh, heck, I got sites that are even on lower end hosting where, you know, the actual server has like 50 gigs of RAM and, you know, you can, you can spike and use a little bit more if you have to. Hers was limited, almost like I think it is a VPS is what they set her up with. But, you know, virtual private server where you have a finite amount of RAM and four gigs is, that's kind of baseline for a web server. Uh, for an active e-commerce site, you really need especially more RAM. Uh, hosting is about CPU power. It's about uh, hard drive size and certainly RAM. RAM is the key. So anyway, the next level up bumped her to 16 gigs. So it went from four gigs to 16 gigs. So that was quite a jump up and she's been okay, but there's a couple approaches that I kind of laid out she could do. Uh, the first idea is something that the WooCommerce documentation recommends in this situation. And uh, they recommend that you set up memberships. And that way, when somebody buys a product, they're buying um, sort of a, of a membership plan type product. 
And that then gives you access to multiple products within it. So instead of somebody ordering every individual product that they want in separate campaigns, separate like, you know, email or social media campaigns that led to uh, downloading this one thing, um, you can you can get them on some, it could be a recurring membership or it could be maybe good for a year, uh, but you could get the customers to do one order and that order grants them access to a dynamic range of, of products. So that's one suggestion. Uh, she wasn't quite ready for that. Uh, so it's more something to mull over, but what we did come up with as an alternative is, okay, these downloads, their design patterns is what she sells. So once somebody buys it and downloads it, it's kind of done for them unless she updates the files. So we decided we're going to do a 90 day plan where when they order something, that order exists for 90 days and then it goes away and they can always order it again. Uh, if it's the free one, if it's a paid order, then it stays in the system uh, indefinitely. Really even paid orders have a lifespan to them. I don't think you're going to keep a paid order forever, but um you know, those would last longer. So the free orders, the, the ones that are two thirds of our database, those were going to just uh, cut off after 90 days. So that, that was kind of the solution there to um, clean up that, that, uh, that huge, huge, uh, you know, amount of data coming in. All right. So we're on slide two. Is that loading up now? This is my first time using this slide program on Zoom. So I want to make sure. You're good. All good. You're good. All right. Okay. All good. Yeah. So that, that quick story is kind of to outline the, the trouble you can run into when it comes to amassing data and how it can happen kind of easily and uh, can even happen on things you're giving away for that matter. Uh, oh, by the way, another solution uh, that's recommended, especially in the, at the enterprise level is because they have multi-channels, you know, they have different um, systems that are creating orders. You know, you have customer service using a CRM, making an order, you have web traffic, mobile apps, uh, reseller channels, et cetera. So in a, in a bigger context, uh, you use a central CRM ERP solution. So WooCommerce is really just one channel. Um, but in, in the, for this audience, we're, we're going to just assume, and certainly for my clients, we're going to say WooCommerce is, the main channel. I mean, some of them do have like a point of sale solution. Um, and we sync that up with Square or with QuickBooks, for example, so that, you know, you, you sell, um, I, one of my clients is a yarn shop out of Denver and they use QuickBooks. So they have a point of sale computer and they'll sell, you know, yarn. It goes out of stock. Now nobody can buy it on the web because it's synced up or vice versa. If uh, an online order comes in, you don't want your point of sale software to show that you have it in stock when you don't. So, so that, you know, that that's more what we deal with with small businesses. It's your, it's your WooCommerce site and maybe, you know, a point of sale if you have a physical storefront or another channel like that. Um, okay. So the other big point is boosting performance here. So when, when we look at performance, database cleanup is not the first thing that you do. Really the first thing that you do, I, I divided this into back end and front end. Back end, you're going to start with reducing your plugins. Um, <laughs> I can't tell you how many sites I come across where they have like 40 plugins running. And, you know, I, I copy the site down to my development environment. Uh, I'm going to show you some stats on that a little bit later but I trim those plugins way down. I get it to where we've got 10 plugins that you actually need to run your site. And I'm running those on my dev environment because I really, I don't want to run the bulk of somebody's, you know, all their, all their stuff that we don't really need for development. So I, I cut that down and that's trained me to advise the client too on, you know, we need to triage your plugins and we need to create a group that, you know, we can just kind of easily lose their, their trivial plugins a group that maybe we have to work towards consolidating and then the core group that you really do need and that your site's not going to run without. So plugin cleanup is a huge performance factor there. Uh, your hosting is also a huge performance factor. Um, hosts are not made alike as far as how much RAM they allocate, how many CPU cycles they allocate, how fast the bus speeds of their equipment is ranges widely. Um, you know, all, all web hosting is on a server. How many other sites are on that server and what kind of volatility does it have throughout the day with traffic spikes and things? So database cleanup kind of comes in after that. You know, you want to work on your plugins first and 
making sure that you're using the proper kind of host. There's many different types of hosts. There's no one single answer to this. Uh, certainly managed hosting is, is what, what I would recommend, but even within that, there's many choices. So once you feel comfortable with, um, you know, the functionality you're running, the hosting, uh, handling your traffic, you know, the next thing to probably look at is cleaning up your database because over time it's going to build, build stuff up that is really just going to slow you down and prevent future growth. You're going to have to keep bumping up those hosting plans unnecessarily. Okay, and then you also have front-end performance. We're not really going to talk about that in this, in this uh, talk, but it's worth mentioning, you know, if you run your site through like Google PageSpeed Insights, you can find a lot of opportunity to improve the front end, you know, with image compression, CDNs, browser caching, um, image optimization, lazy loading came out in the latest version of WordPress, but there's also lazy loading videos and things like that. There's a lot you could do on the front end to really, really make performance better. But the database relates to the back end. So let's move on here. So modern websites are databases. Um, you know, I remember back when I started in development before we had content management system way back when, um, it would be like uh, maybe a developer would have like front page loaded up with the site and they generate out all these HTML files and would FTP them up to the website. And then whenever you'd want to make a change, you know, you'd have to kind of redo that process again. Modern websites have an interface you can log into, manage your, um, your settings and your, your content design and functionality like I list out here. And that is a content management system and that goes into a database. Your, your website really is a database effectively. So the content aspect is really the, the king area here. And that is going to be your users, your pages and posts, all the metadata that go with every one of those things. Your taxonomies, that's your categories and tags, your menus, your sidebar widgets. In the case of e-commerce, you've got products, orders, customers, product metadata, and then there's all these indexes that now come into place for the reporting to work well. And you also have custom post types if you, uh, depending on how you set up your site. Uh, some sites make tremendous use of custom fields and custom types. Uh, most of the sites I do, I really don't do a whole lot of that. I try to be minimalistic about that, but certainly there, there are cases for using some of those. And I've come across sites where the whole design was done in ACF with custom fields and template files. <laughs> it makes it a little hard to work on. Uh, page builders are bringing us a long way there. Um, but anyway, all of that is data. All of that is your content. Okay, so the next part, the design, you know, this is your theme, your child theme, all the customizer settings that you do, that goes into the database too. Functionality is what plugins you're using, what core features you're using, the settings for all of those plugins. And the biggest thing is the plugins that you're no longer using that left a bunch of settings behind. We'll get into that in a bit. So this is all the data that really goes into your site. And whenever I look at a, a site coming in to me for the first time, I look at the database, I could see all this and tell what's going on with it pretty quick. Oh, we jumped ahead. Okay, about the database. So th this is the most valuable part of your site. If you just give me the database, I can make the site run locally because I can procure most of your plugins and your theme usually. Um, even your image files on, on my dev sites, I just pull images from live. I don't even cache them locally. I just put a rewrite rule. I, I don't want to store, you know, some of my clients have 10,000 images and then every one of those images has 20 different thumbnails and stuff. So I don't bother. I don't bother with that. I don't even back it up. I let the host back that up or um, put them on like a weekly backup routine for that. But the database is really the part that, uh, really matters. So point number two there, it's high volatility. Every time somebody logs into the site, every time content gets added, a page gets visited, somebody adds something to the shopping cart, that's all data going in in real time. So I, on an e-commerce site, I would back up your database practically hourly, if not every four or eight hours. Daily is usually not enough, uh, but it does depend on how active your store is. Hosting is uh, usually quoted based on traffic because that's a number most businesses have. Um, but really the data tells us more. 
because if it's a blog site where your visitors are just viewing a page, maybe leaving a comment, you can really cache that. It, it, it's not heavy on the server um, as traffic scales, but e-commerce is heavy on the server as traffic scales. You've got uh, people adding to cart, um, you know, checking out. Uh, some sites feature like wait lists and wish lists and gift cards and all kinds of activities people can be doing uh, on the site. Not just commenting on blog posts. It goes way beyond that. Um, in fact, uh, in WooCommerce, the orders have comments on them. Those are called um, order notes. <laughs> it's using the comment system. So a, a lot of that data is being used in, uh, for your products and for your orders and your customer records. And then point number four, uh, data uses RAM on the server, especially the global stuff that has to load site-wide. Um, I'm going to show you some stats here in, in a, on a slide coming up where um, what I consider uh, on, my, on my development sites where I have a lot of plugins turned off, only the critical ones on, I consider an 80 megabyte boot up to be normal. Um, you know, just like for one visitor to hit your site, you know, and, and that's on my dev environments with a lot of stuff turned off. So in production, your boot up might be, you know, 128 megabytes, 256 megabytes. That's just for your site to even be able to render to a single user. And then you have the variable data with the, the user, user themselves and their sessions and their transients and all that stuff. Uh, and then also data, second to last point here, database queries um, that happen between the web application and the database, the SQL queries. You can have a lot of them going on. Some of them can be big. You can have duplicates. Some of them can be slow. So we're going to kind of look at how you, how you measure, how you tell that stuff, because that's important to know for sure if you want to optimize your database. It's not just the data in it. It's the activity going on with it. And then last point, which I made earlier, your previously installed plugins as well as themes that you've had before, they leave a bunch of settings behind. And those are really of no use uh, to you going forward. So those really should be deleted. Okay, so let's set some goals here for, for this cleanup. Uh, by the way, the uh, WordCamp talk that's in the works on this, we're, we're not announcing it yet, we don't have dates, but um, I am actually going to do a live demo. So, so some of the material here is kind of related to that. So when we talk about cleanup goals, um, you know, our goals we talked about earlier, speeding up your site, we're going to measure that in uh, time to first byte and response time. Uh, those two things are actually very similar. There is a technical difference between the two, but, you know, for the purpose of this, let's consider them the same. That's how long it takes the server to start responding to me. Uh, you know, when I make a request, but not, not talking about downloading all the assets of the page, just get me the start of this page. How long does that take? And then the front end tests for meaningful paint time and fully loaded time, those follow that. So your TTFB is the start and then everything else kind of stacks up um, beyond that. So you got to start with TTFB. If you can't improve that, everything else is going to suffer. <laughs> so you got to start with your, your response time. Um, and then also you want to prevent backup file bloats because the more junk data you have, the bigger those backup files are. And you could be paying overage fees for storage, for backups. Maybe you're not running your backups often enough because the thing is too big and you just, you know, if you're storing your backups off site, you're paying bandwidth to copy those files up every day or multiple times a day. So cleaning things up will certainly help with that. Saving on hosting costs, you don't have to jump up to the next tier. Um, personally, I use Site District a lot, and they have a baseline fee, plus they charge uh, like bandwidth overage and storage overage uh, and RAM overage, which is much more variable dynamic. Most of the hosts out there, we're talking managed hosts. We're not talking the low-end shared hosting, just managed hosts. Usually they're, they're doing things in tiers, you know, based on your traffic. That kind of sets your, your base price. Uh, and that, that can be high. It can be hundreds of dollars a month, potentially. So by keeping your site cleaner, you're, you're keeping yourself um, on those lower tiers, uh, avoiding those overage fees. And then making room for growth, you know, we're, we're assuming, especially in an e-commerce site, that you want to continue to take orders. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully you want room to grow customers and orders. Uh, if not, then maybe um, 
your problem isn't technical. Maybe it's more uh, something else there. But uh, generally, growth is what we're seeing right now, especially with shopping at home. But you know, that's that's really the goal. Uh, and then I, I also put a little note there. So websites are really serving your current users, your current customers, current staff, current stakeholders. It, it's really not a historic archive unless you're running maybe a museum or a government type entity where you have to keep careful archives for a very long period of time. Generally, your website is, is about the now and the near term it's not really much about the past. You, you can have old blog posts and old orders and stuff, but it really does become junk after a while, in my opinion. Maybe some SEO people might disagree with me on that, but you know, you, the main goal of the site is is to serve, you know, the current audience. All right, steps to clean up. I'm, I got a slide on each one of these, and then we're going to go into Q and A. So. Actually, I got a surprise in between, but we'll, we'll get there. Um, so the five steps here is check in the built-in tools that are already built into WordPress and WooCommerce that can help guide you here. So we'll talk about those. Printing outdated stuff in the admin area that you can just see and maybe take the time to actually clean up. Um, hopefully we can build up your courage on that today. Uh, running a database cleanup plugin. Um, key queries that I recommend you run in your, in your database admin, uh, usually called PHP my admin, to really see what's going on diagnostically. And then um, the query monitor plugin is uh, sort of like the APM of WordPress. If you're familiar with application performance monitoring tools, those usually run on the server and they tell developers exactly the performance of their units, what's going on. Well, the query monitor plugin is kind of like that for WordPress. Um, it gives you a lot of insights into very specific database queries. So we're going to talk about that as well. All right, so step one of five here. This is, I, I don't think there's any official list on exactly what steps to clean up your database. This is more my, like my five-step plan here. Um, <laughs> no copyright intended. So, so there's built-in tools that you want to be sure to look at. The WordPress admin site health is a great one to look at. And it not only um, just shows you your passing grade, but you can click and look at the details and see which, which tests you've passed and what concerns it may have. Uh, and then the WooCommerce status is even more useful. It counts your post types and gives you much more granular information. That's the thing that the Woo support people want you to copy and paste every time you open a support ticket. Um, that's a whole system report, but it includes a lot of data um, related to your database. Um, and then in under WooCommerce, there's a tools section where you can do these last th three points here. You can uh, clear out WooCommerce and expired transients. You can see if there's any orphaned product variations. And you can also verify that your database tables are all up to date. And they've got a whole bunch more buttons like to re recount your terms, redo your indexes, all kinds of things that could be useful. But um, like one of them is clear out customer sessions and you probably don't want to really do that one um, unless maybe it's on a dev site where you don't want that stuff or, uh, or you just did a big upgrade or something and you want to get rid of the, yeah, usually that button you wouldn't click. But they have some buttons in there that you probably do want to click. So have a look at those for sure. That's a good start. Okay, step two. Um, this is in that WordPress admin area. Just clean stuff out on your own. You know, back it up first. Make sure you know what you're doing. But look at your users, especially um, people who are not customers, like subscribers that maybe shouldn't be there. Um, staff accounts that uh, don't really apply anymore. Old developers that aren't around anymore. Um, those should be deleted. Uh, for security more than anything, but also just to have a clean, uh, clean database. Media library. I think every site I come across has thousands of <laughs> media files and trying to get clients to clean it out. I don't offer that as a service because I don't know what images are still being used and which ones are, you know, copyright protected or whatever, but there is a media cleanup plugin you can get. I think it's a pro plugin for like 50 bucks or whatever um, that can help guide that, but it really, you really have to know what you're doing, what media items are safe to purge. But you know, that's, that's file space. Um, 
disk space. That's also database entries and metadata that, um, you know, and unless you just always use images and always leave that, that old content, when you get rid of that old content, you should get rid of the old images too. So you're not archiving those. I mean, some of these sites are gigabytes worth of compressed data. It, it can really get big. And the media library is a big area for that. Post types and field groups, we talked about that earlier. Uh, any of those that have been replaced, and oftentimes they are, um, especially now with page builders, we're seeing sections where, oh, we used to have like a job section. So we had this plugin and it added these post types for job and requirement and you know position and salary and all these taxonomies and stuff. And yeah, we're not using that anymore. Well, it left all its data there. So you are using it, uh, you're, you're, you're not using it. <laughs> the users of your site aren't using it, but your database is still using it. So that's a good way to, uh, to see that. We, we talked about in the WooCommerce tools, it can show you that. So I would clear those out as, as possible. Uh, posts, which would be pages, products, blog posts, things like that. Um, you know, most sites need about five to 10 pages, you know, home about contact, FAQ, privacy policy, you know, like five to 10. I've come across sites that have like 80 pages. You know, we used to put specials up and, you know, this special's from five years ago and the page is still there, you know. Um, so those kind of things, I would just, I would get rid of it. <laughs> if it's not serving any current and near-term users, then it probably doesn't belong on your site. If you want your site to be fast and, uh, you know, able to be backed up and uh, able to be maintained into the future as we, as we have new themes that we have to upgrade and install WooCommerce. Hell, I think it's updated five times in the last few weeks. It feels like uh, as all these updates keep rolling through, you know, the more weight you have in your database, the, you know, the tougher that is to, uh, to merge categories as well, whether they're product or blog categories. And then, you know, tags, any, any taxonomies, it's usually categories and tags. And then in WooCommerce, we have product attributes, which can be global or at the product level. Um, I usually do those as global so I can easily find them. Uh, I, I would not recommend defining them at the product level exclusively because then it's hard to, hard to find um, to clean up later. So uh, and then we talked about WooCommerce order history a little bit, but we didn't talk about the statuses. So completed orders, uh, we talked about, you know, maybe if they're free, 90 days is good. You know, if they're paid, maybe five years is good. Well, what about like canceled or refunded or failed or pending payment? You know, those should all kind of have their, their policies as well in your business. So I would think about how long those should stick around for and uh, not make it too long. Um, but it does depend on how many of those you're getting. You know, every, every business is different in that regard. Step three of five, uh, the database cleanup plugin. So we've got WP Optimize and Advanced Database Cleaner. And those are going to wipe out post revisions. Um, you can also set them to do like an automated, like, um, you know, once a week, clean it out, but save the last week of, of uh, revisions. Um, I've seen sites with hundreds or even thousands of post revisions that are just sitting there. Um, so it's good to, there's also a setting you can do in your WP config file to actually tell WordPress only store the last X number. So that, that's one option. Um, I kind of think instead of storing X number, it's better to have it by, be by date and just say, I only really need revisions for the last week or two. Um, orphan post meta, that does no good. That means the, the parent was deleted and all the post meta for it or some of the post meta was not. So the, those plugins can clear that out. Comments, you got spam and unapproved comments to clear out. Um, custom tables from plugins that aren't being used anymore. I see that all the time. The worst offender is WordFence. It adds like 50 tables to your site. And if somebody no longer uses WordFence or they switch to security, <laughs> they may have left all those tables in there. And those are really not useful. It's very, um, uh, what's the word? It's very temporary information, uh, really, all, all those security logs and stuff. I, I really don't see the value in like keeping that for the long term. And then clearing transients, WordPress flushes, 
transients. Those are caches that it creates as users browse your site. They're like session variables that are stored in the database. Um, they have expirations. Most of them have expirations and they clear out automatically, but they can build up. So if you've done a big upgrade on your site, you may want to just manually clear them out instead of waiting, you know, for the next big cycle. And then defragmenting is that optimized table thing that you may have seen in your database plugins. It's not really something you have to do. It, it kind of depends on how fragmented your table is. So you could look into that. But uh, for NODB tables, and that's what we recommend you use now, more on that later, uh, it's a good idea to uh, clear that, uh, to, to defragment it if, if you need to, but not to do it over aggressively because it does lock your tables while it's doing it. And it takes time for it to uh, process. So defragmenting is, is a little questionable maybe. Step four, um, this is where I have some uh, queries. There's a link in the upper right. You'll be able to download these slides at the end, by the way. And then there's hyperlinks there you can click and uh, view my, the queries I recommend to view your, your WP Options auto load data and then top, uh, top rows by size. I've definitely seen some huge stuff. Uh, like one of the offenders is the WP all export plugin. Um, it, it, I found it leaving a ton of like big data behind in your WP options table. And that data is really no use. You've done your export. It's done. Why leave it there? You know, uh, I've seen that a lot. Uh, Jetpack has been a big offender there too in the past. They've cleaned things up a lot, but you can still find some old stuff in there that needs to go. So check your WP options table first. A lot of those auto load entries, they eat up RAM. Remember we talked about that, you know, 80 megabyte or 200 megabyte footprint just for your site to boot up uh, into RAM. Well, that's where you can really trim that down as WP options. I put the query here, a picture of it uh, on the right. But again, you can link to it when you click that SQL here link in the upper right. And then post meta and user meta, that's to see like what plugins have been adding into your orders, your products, your users. You know, there might be like uh, an analytic data and stuff that you just don't need anymore that you can get rid of. So you can use my queries to take a look at those things. And then the last step we, we talked a little bit about is the query monitor plugin that really gives you that, um, uh, that fine-tuned view of, oh, no, that's not the right way to say it. Uh, the application measuring view of what's going on with your site. And you can drill it down by plugin. You could go by query. Uh, I list here on the left-hand side, you could look at slow queries. I find it good to look by plugin uh, or by function. It's pretty useful. So when I do the, uh, WordCamp talk, we're actually going to do a live demo on that. So, and if we have time today, we might be able to take a look at one. Uh, I don't actually have a, well, I have branded sites we could look at. So we'll have to turn recording off if we do that, but that's, that's a possibility if we, uh, if we have time for that today. Okay. So next is some data. So I ran this plugin on, um, what is this about like 40, 45, development sites that I have. So this is all running on my local server. And I ran this plugin. It may be hard to see some of these numbers. Um, but I, so the, at the high level, without drilling down, um, Query Monitor gives you your page generation time, the amount of memory overhead, the database query time, number of database queries, number of duplicates, and then the PHP caching. Uh, and based on this data that I ran, and these are dev sites, so they had a lot of plugins turned off. These numbers are actually kind of low. Um, but down at the very bottom, I kind of, uh, by the data, I, I informed a threshold on that and said, you know, I'm going to consider it slow if the generation time is over one second. And then the, the third column there is memory megabytes. I said 85 megabytes is the baseline I was kind of seeing from the data. Uh, database time is a tenth of a second. Uh, database query is about 150. Okay. I mean, did you really realize that every visitor, this is just the home page, by the way, I, I didn't run this on many different pages, just the home page, you know, there's 150 database queries going on and a few of those are rights. And, and this is on a dev site where I've got most of the stuff turned off. I mean, that, that's a lot of queries taking place. Uh, four dupes, duplicates. And then I 
the data suggests that a 93% PHP caching was the was the lowest uh, kind of baseline there. So this is interesting data. Uh, again, I uh, we're not really doing a live demo here, so I don't want to bore you <laughs> going into too many details, but I did find, uh, you know, looking at data is always interesting because you really can see patterns and start to see, okay, you know, I can see where some sites now, I, I didn't put the name of the site. I took that column out because I don't want to bias anything or, you know, give away any, um, any proprietary information from clients. But uh, definitely, you know, especially take the names out, look at the numbers and you can see like, uh, you know, that, that one, I don't know, 12 down or so, 113 megabytes. And then the one down closer to the bottom, 231 megabytes. That's a pretty big footprint for a single user <laughs> opening the homepage, you know. So if your server only has four gigabytes, how many of those people can you actually have on the site at one time? <laughs> you could do the math and kind of figure that out pretty easily. Okay. And then I have a couple bonus slides. I don't really want to go into them because I think it may get a little too technical here. But uh, I'll just mention, uh, you know, there's some things you can do on your server, your database server and your web server to improve performance. Going to NODB tables is good. Making sure that you have the MB4, that's the version 4 UTF-8 uh, configuration, which has been standard since WordPress 4.2. Some sites I come across still don't have that set right. Uh, using the Unicode collation is um, for international support, what you want to use. There's a whole bunch of other uh, language and char set related ones, but the Unicode 520 is like the official one. So if you want your site to work with multinational um, characters, you really want that set. And then database configuration file, there's, there's those things I list at the bottom, including a link to the instructions. And then the last slide here is, um, uh, you could see some real-time data. Uh, well, okay, so this is related to the web server um, and your traditional application performance monitoring tools like New Relic, for example, that you could install if you had a physical server, you could install and get graphs on the server. The query monitor plugin does a lot of that for you, but uh, at the server level, you know, you might need help if you're really running into problems on your site and it's not clear what they are, uh, sometimes I could tell you a quick story about how this did help me once. Um, a client said, uh, you know, how come on the staging site I place an order and it takes one second to go in. And then on the live site, it takes about seven seconds for an order to go in. And I said, well, what did you do? <laughs> because uh, I did the staging site and it's fast. You set up the production server and it's slow. What did you do? I don't know. I didn't do nothing okay, well, let's put new relic on and see what the graphs show. And it turns out it was the email configuration. He set up an SMTP uh, email that was logging into, uh, I think it was Gmail. So every time you place an order, it sent an email to the customer, an email to the admin, a stock notification email. And every time, you know, PHP would be waiting for Gmail to authenticate. So your order time went from one second to like seven. Um, and that was something that really it took New Relic to kind of point that out as to what that problem was. So I like Site District a lot, as I mentioned earlier. Um, Matt may even be on the phone possibly or on this call uh, because they offer a free migration. Um, so you can install their plugin, copy your site over. They have some tests that they can run on it. Uh, and that's pretty useful uh, diagnostic information. Pantheon, I've also partnered with. They have New Relic built into their dev sites. Their dev sites are definitely a bit more tricky to figure out. Um, so, you know, it, it's it's a bit of a learning curve. It's a very nerd friendly um, company, I would say. Uh, but yeah, they have New Relic built in. They have a special deal with them, so you can actually get it for free um, to play around. So I definitely want to throw that out there. I mean, both of these tools are free for you for diagnostic. Uh, you know, purposes. Certainly if you launch your site on them, that costs money. But if you're doing diagnostics, uh, those are free tools. So go for it. And then if you have access to your server config, there's Apache and, and Nginx and PHP settings you can get into. So I'm not going to go into that. Let's do Q&A now. So let me stop share, go back to gallery, and let's open it up. Who's got questions? All right. Um, great job, Chris. I mean, I'm sorry. Great job, Sean. I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. I'm thinking Chris Aldridge. All right. 
Um, we'll start at the bottom and work our way up. Yep. Um, Scott asks, is there a simple way to change all the tables from my ISM to mm -hmm. NODB? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is. There's a, in fact, if you, if you read my uh, article on it, I think I have that. I think I have that link. Well, I put the link in the slides. And by the way, on that last slide, which I'll share again, uh, it kind of came out blue, but um, uh, yeah, let me, let me turn the sharing back on so you could see this link and everybody could download the slides and you could see the, uh, the link. Share, let's go back to, okay. Yeah, sorry, it came out blue. Let me, oh, there we go. If I highlight it, you could see it. So it's codedcommerce.com slash 2020 DB cleanup. And, and on these slides, I have a link to my article. I think I do. Instructions. Oh, I thought I had a link to my article. Maybe I don't. Well, anyway, go to my site. And I will switch sharing over to that right now. Which share, new share, Firefox. Okay, go to my site and then scroll down to popular articles. And the very first article I have is database, uh, clean, cleaning up your Woo, WooCommerce database. This has actually done really well on Google. I must say it's my most popular article I've ever written. So that kind of informed this topic. But if you go down here, I've got um, query number one right here is to ensure your database uses NODB. If you take this query and you run it in PHP My Admin, it will generate a list of queries to convert those tables. And then you have to um, copy those and paste those into the SQL and then, uh, and then run them. And it'll convert all the tables that are my ISAM over to NODB uh, almost immediately. You know, you can also use uh, the interconnect search and replace tool. Mm -hmm. One of the things it does in, in addition to search and replace is you can pick a table or pick a bunch of tables and it'll convert them to the NODB. Oh, good. And I haven't seen if WPCLI does this. I know WPCLI does search replace, um, but I'm not sure if it does the NODB thing. So I, have, I haven't seen it. I, I, yeah, I know WPCLI does the search and replace. I haven't seen it, anything, anybody comment on the fact that it would do that, but, mm -hmm. but I do know that the, the interconnect uh, slash IT search and replace tool, mm -hmm. um, occasionally that tool will hit Ajax conflicts and it won't run, but if it mm -hmm. will run, uh, it does a great job of converting. Mm -hmm. I think I've, that one comes with a command line as well. You can run it from your terminal, as I recall. Yeah, because I, I think I tried it one time and the Ajax was a problem, but I was able to run it. It comes with a CLI bundled in. You can run it from your terminal and that worked. Um, but I don't think I ever did a, uh, an NODB, you know, a my ISAM to NODB swap on it. I think that was, I, I've only done it with this query and you paste it into PHP my admin, you copy the results and paste those. So. I haven't tried there your CLI. I'll have to try that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're saying their plugin specifically does the table engine uh, swap? Well, it's not a plugin. It's a, it's a, right. You upload a, a, a zip file and then you uncompress mm -hmm. the zip file in the root directory and mm -hmm. it creates a folder called search and replace. Mm -hmm. I generally rename that to SR and then you run your website slash SR. Mm -hmm. And it, load, it loads a bunch of scripts and then it gives you the search and replace. Mm -hmm. One of the options on the search and replace page is conversion to the NODB. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it may, may be that you have to use their web GUI uh, and maybe their command line doesn't do that. I'm not sure, know. but it's worth, look, it was worth looking at. Um, if you have PHP My Admin, though, you can copy and paste this. I think most people have access through their web host to the PHP my admin. Um, uh, but if not, I mean, that, that is a good tool as well. I, I have used it before. I mostly use WPCLI though for search replaces because it's just, it's already built in. You could do all the, all the WordPress command lines with that tool. All right. Um, I, I have a 
couple of questions to, to keep mm -hmm. the, the conversation yeah. going. Um, for those of us that are sort of on the beginner's level, and you know how a mm -hmm. lot of people don't want to delete anything. Yeah, how, confident, oh, yeah. how confident are you when you clean up these databases or how, how confident should we be and what are the determining factors on mm -hmm. what should go and what shouldn't? How do you know what's in the Elementor um, listing that you had there, for example, and you know you're not deleting something important? Well, you know, you want to, of course, back up and you also want to measure performance before and after because you want to be able to show the benefit of what you've done <laughs> because, you know, I, I've had jobs where it's pure politics. You go in, basically the people who sit around and do nothing but blame others get the promotions and the people who actually do the work are taking all the risks and they just get, you know, pooped on all day long. I, I've, I've been at toxic cultures like that. So, you know, the, the, the bottom line is, you know, to do the work, definitely keep records, keep track of what you're doing, what the benefits are, keep backups, you know, so that you're protecting yourself because things can go wrong. And, you know, anytime you're making any effort to develop anything, you're taking on risks. And uh, if you're in a culture where that's not, you know, that's risk averse, where it's not appreciated, then, um, you know, fire the client or work somewhere else. Uh, that's my best advice. What, what do you use to back up? Oh, I use um, Updrafts Plus quite a bit. Uh, there have been occasions where Updrafts Plus can't, can't get it because the database is too big or too volatile. In those cases, I'll install WP Term and I'll do a command line MySQL dump. Um, there is another one called WP Migrate DB Pro that's really good. Um, that one, you have to have a pro membership. They, they have a free version, but the free version doesn't do much. You got to have the pro one and I, maybe it's a hundred bucks or something. So that can, that can do a pretty good job, but I've even seen that fail on a site before where I've actually literally like a client came in, you know, their site was so active. Uh, I didn't have server access. I had to install WP term and, and like do a command line, my SQL dump, you know, user password, you know, dump to this file and then zip up that file and download it through my browser and then quickly delete it. I actually had to, had to do that to get around backup plugins failing. Um, and again, that happens if the database is such a mess that you can't run a database backup plugin. I've seen that happen. Um, once you clean up the database and get it good, then you can run the plugins again. Okay. And Ron had a question. Using WP Optimize, do you value the, the table tab that shows all tables and their sizes mm -hmm and amounts considered overhead, which sometimes yeah, the, show the size in red text. Is that useful? Yeah, the overhead is, is the fragmentation thing we talked about. And some of the tables will just show like four megabyte. That's really nothing. You don't need to defragment that. If it's getting to be a big number, you know, then I would, I would run a defragmentation or an optimize as, as it's called in SQL. Um, but yeah, I do like the, that plugin and I like the table tab that that shows you your tables it tries to tell you which tables are no longer needed but i found that to be a little bit buggy um like i, I found it say some tables you know can be deleted but it really was a plugin that was active or it thought the table belonged to a different plugin than what it really was so you can't believe that one 100 percent, but it is useful it's a good tool in, so, in your, um, oh go ahead Brian. i'm sorry i just wanted to ask sean um so i've got a client that I inherited and it's a an adoption support, you know, not for profit organization. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking at their table view in W optimize right now. And, and for instance, WP options shows one, 150,000 records mm -hmm. and its size is 17 megabytes and it shows an overhead of 344 kilobytes mm. in, oh, kilobyte. in red. Oh. So yeah. and I think there's a whole <laughs> lot of cruft in here, but I, I'm really, really nervous about trying to find it. And well, if it's 300, it 300 kilobytes is not a lot. I wouldn't worry oh, about okay. that. The problem with running the optimize on InnoDB tables is the, as I understand it, is the locking because- No, these are the, my, my sense. My okay. Same. Yeah. Most so same. my, my ISAM does tend to need more of the defragmentation done to it and, mm -hmm. and it runs faster. It's easier to defragment those. 
Um, but you actually should convert to NODB if we're talking about an e-commerce site because it uh, is. Yeah, it's really NODB cool. is better cool. for transactional. It's faster, better performing. For Thank that. you for that. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Right. It is the standard now. If you install a new WordPress site, it'll come set up with NODB. All right. Um, and then one last question on your database chart that we showed all the different sizes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you have a general range where it raises a red flag and then you know you want to go in and clean that up? Like you, you showed us one that was over 200 yeah. and one that was in the hundreds. Is there a certain yeah. number you look for? Uh, I mean, looking kind of at those averages, it informs what I would call a threshold that I would consider like a safe base. And again, these are dev sites. So these were already clean. Well, some of them weren't fully clean, but most of them were generally cleaned. So I would say a life site, those numbers might be a bit higher. And uh, again, you taught Ron talked about red. So <laughs> the, uh, the query monitor plugin will definitely light up in all kinds of colors to kind of help guide you. <laughs> so the, the use of colors can be deceiving. It's not always the most accurate thing in the world, but uh, that can help, you know, indicate where you should, where you should be looking. Um, and again, on a life site, I would expect those numbers to be higher. So don't be surprised. Query monitor is used more on development environments to optimize your testing in there. Um, but if you're having problems on a life site, I think it's safe to run there. It doesn't write to the database or anything. So it does add a db.php drop-in file on the server. So you definitely have to have write access to that. I, I, unless you're on like a restricted hosting environment, it should run. Okay. Um, and that sort of ties back to a much earlier question. And I think it's more on a, a basic level. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asked, what does query mean in relation to your database talk? Yeah, so the applications for your WordPress and your plugins, those are PHP files. And those applications, in order to talk to the database, they send a query. And the query is, get me this data or write this data or update this data. And those are all uh, SQL, SQL queries that take place between the PHP code and where the data is stored. Um, the the pro it's different processors. Your, your PHP is part of your web server, which is like your Apache or your Nginx um, web server. And that has its own resources, right? And then the MySQL or MariaDB SQL server is your database server. And that also has RAM and resources that it uses. So the, these are two engines that are f running on your site and they talk via SQL. Okay, great. Uh, Sue had an, a question. Mm -hmm. If you use something like GT Metrics or Lighthouse, will the need to clean your database show up there? Well, it's going to mostly be in the, the early number, the TTFB number that we talked about. And then all the other numbers just kind of fall in line from there. The very first number you're getting is time to first byte, uh, often referred to as response time there is a slight different time to first byte is literally the first byte response time is when is the server done with, with its response. And then all the assets load from all your CDNs, all your images and JavaScript files and the browser pulls those separately. So response time is the server's response to your page request. Time to first byte is how long did it take to get that the first byte from that. They're basically the same thing as far as I'm concerned. I mean, roughly speaking. So that number is gonna be the start and then everything else kind of trickles down from there. So your database cleanliness will, uh, along with the power of your web host, will determine TTFB. It's supposed to be within half a second. Uh, the dev sites I showed you, we were, we were about, some of them were low, but it, we were sort of in the one second range. Um, and that's, uh, my dev sites rang off my computer here. So I, I, would, I would expect that to not be tremendously fast. Um, uh, yeah, I've seen, to give you an example, I saw one client who was getting like a three and a half second TTFB. We moved her to site district and it went down to a one second TTFB. And all we changed was the host. We didn't change any plugins, any data. I mean, just moving hosts made a huge difference. But here's the thing. One second is still not good. That is still double what you should have. So clearly that person they needed a better host, but they also needed 
their plugins to be cleaned up, their database to be cleaned up to really run and get that down to where it should be. Okay, and, and just a random question, sort of off topic. When, when you're building in WooCommerce, what's your go-to theme or, or what plugins do you like since we have a few minutes here? Yeah, well, the official WooCommerce plugins are, are gonna be the, be the the most vetted, the best quality, the ones you get from WooCommerce.com. Um, there are some good third-party ones. There's plenty that are in the, in the WordPress plugin repository that are good. You gotta look at how popular they are, their, their rating, um, if they seem like they're up to date. I definitely like plugins to be updated like every month. Same with the theme. Um, personally, I use Storefront for all, all the sites that I cut the themes for um, because I could make it look like anything and it's the official theme, so it's safe. Um, but there are, I mean, I have clients using like Divi or Beaver Builder theme or Elementor. Does Elementor have a theme? I know it's yeah, a plugin. It may have a theme. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Genesis, I have some that are Genesis theme. You know, it's all over the place, but the themes that I cut, I just use storefront because I know that's going to be the most solid WooCommerce. I'm considering WooCommerce the core of the site and everything else is kind of added in because usually in e-commerce site, um, WooCommerce is kind of the center point of, of every, everything kind of hovers around that usually. Yeah, sure. hey, John, uh, WooCommerce, I'm sorry, Elementor does have a theme. It's called Hello. Oh, hello. Nice. Is that, do you have to have pro to get access to that? No, no. It's, it's in the repository. Oh, yeah. good. Okay. Thanks. And then even for, even for someone building their first WooCommerce site, you, you suggest going with Storefront or what's, what's the beginner's yeah. kit? I like Storefront and I will be presenting on Storefront with our WooCommerce LA group in probably a month or two. I know Andrew just presented on the Astra theme. It's a very popular one. There's a ton of like really popular WooCommerce themes out there. I like storefront just to be as official and, and kind of canvas like as possible. So I could add my own CSS code and, um, you know, use the official plugins, know that they're tested with the theme already kind of have that confidence for the, the growth of it. WooCommerce updates a lot. So I know the storefront theme is well tested. Um, they're going to be very quick to respond to security issues. Um, certainly we talk about accessibility in the talk earlier today, storefront is a leading theme on accessibility. So there's a lot of benefits to using it, but if somebody wants to use another popular Woo theme, I think that's fine. If it's, if it's a well-known popular theme, the quality should be there for performance as well. And I guess in terms of when you first think to look to your database, um, how do you, does it manifest in, in basic site operation in general, or is just, do you recommend it as something that you do in terms of your, your basic process in terms of checking in on, on what you have on the site? Yeah, it, it really is ongoing. Um, I mean, you know, how often do you wash your car? You know, uh, some people are really obsessive about it. Other people, it goes a long time. But, you know, eventually, if you want to like your car, you probably should give it a wash at least a couple times a year, you know. <laughs> so I think your your database, as you, as you add stuff into it, as you've experimented with plugins and gotten rid of them, uh, as you've made changes to your site, that stuff accumulates and should be cleaned up. Some of it just happens on its own, just with software updates. You've got outdated stuff in there uh, that doesn't clean itself up. So I would say at least every year kind of looking at it is a good idea. But if you have just gotten rid of a bunch of plugins, that's a great time to go get rid of the settings that those plugins have left behind. Um, and I didn't do the demo in this presentation, but for the WordCamp talk that we're, we're planning right now, um, it's not announced yet. We don't have the, the details, but I'm planning to do a live demo where we actually delete a plugin and then go in and remove the settings that it left behind. So it, it just had your uh, presentation hasn't been announced or? That... No, it, I, I don't okay. think any, I don't think any of the WordCamp LA presentations have been oh, announced. But you've I think got it's on, sort of the goal. It's oh. on the verge of being okay. announced, but okay. it hasn't okay. happened quite yet. And it'll so, be, yeah. it'll be entitled the same? Or is it going to have a uh, well, different title use, or what are you thinking? I'm not going to use the word WooCommerce and we're just going to call it WordPress database cleanup. Um, yeah. So, okay. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll mention WooCommerce as I did here, of course, but that's going to be more focused on doing a live demo of actually looking, cleaning up a site, or at least it'll be half, half slides, half demo. That's my, my thought. Okay. And then there's one more question if you have time for it. Oh yeah. All right. Um, Ron asks, have you used WP Optimize scheduled optimization? 
and it's mm -hmm. set to be a beta feature. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I've ran that where, where you set it to auto clean. It just adds like a WordPress cron job to run itself. Um, but typically when you're doing auto cleaning, you need to leave the last week or so of data. You know, you don't want someone who's writing a post, saved a draft. Um, it goes and deletes the draft before they've had a chance to publish it. You know, you don't want that to happen. Yeah, um, that's what I do. I usually set it yeah. so that it can preserve the last two weeks of, yeah. of, um, stuff um, stuff <laughs> yeah. what's the word for it? your your drafts your your, your revisions uh, revisions thank you revisions right yeah so it, that's a that's a that's a setting mm -hmm. and really for everyone that does any wordpress wp optimize is really very very important to have and you could get a lot uh very far and uh, the thing that's the things that sean is a, a, an expert in by just running optimization frequently i think or hiring sean <laughs> <laughs> well thanks no it's a very good plugin to have for sure i've used it on a lot of sites um i've it's come free. across the it is free i've come across the advanced database cleaner plugin too and it seems to it doesn't do quite as much but it you know, if you want a lighter weight version, I think that one could be a good option too. Awesome. All right, let's 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 open up the floor for general questions mm -hmm. for Sean or questions in general. Or for anybody, yeah. yeah. I, I have one for Sean. This actually continues the uh, database question. So, mm -hmm. like I said, I mean, I, 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 first of all, great. I already got the notes, so that's great. Uh, and I'm glad to see the SQL commands and all in there. Yeah, did that, are there any SQL commands in there? I haven't really looked at everything, but. I'm looking to see like how would you do a SQL command if you wanted to like get rid of like X number of orders from like a certain date, let's say like from January 1st to the 7th, 31st of 2019. Let's just get rid of the years worth of orders. Yeah, well, you could do a SQL command. I, I actually wrote a plugin for that it's sitting in the repository called uh, WooCommerce Prune Orders. Okay. Yeah, and you can install that plugin. I wrote it like a few years ago for a friend of mine who- Oh, they don't be valid anymore. You don't deal with them. Yeah, well, I've updated the, I've updated the plugin, um, so it still works, but yeah, you can, it, it'll clean orders based on date, uh, date and status. What about just an actual SQL command because uh, this whole idea mm -hmm. is a very, very much anti plugin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, check check out the plugin and you could also do it by SQL if That's you wanted to. What, what is a SQL command do that? Oh, well, what, what my plugin does is it, it throws those posts in the trash, you know, and then you empty no, the trash. Not, that's my point. I mean, yeah. you may not be able to use the plugin. It's, it's complicated. But. Okay. If you have to do it all with SQL, then what exactly. you'll do is you'll delete, um, you know, from the WP post table, uh, all that are post type shop order and that are their date within a you know, date between X and Y, right? And then you could also do status and post status equals something. Once you delete that, you then need to go into WP optimize and delete orphaned post meta because once you delete those posts, they still have post metadata that has to be deleted too. And if you can't, if you can't install that plugin, then you can use a SQL query to delete post meta where you know, you do a join on the post table and it's, that's kind of getting into dangerous territory, but if you have to, if you can't use a plugin. Well, I'm going to run by them, but it, it, it's got to be like five star all the way. You know, like lots of I, I think most people you could sell on WP optimize in that, even though you're adding a plugin, you're not leaving it on all the time right. and you're using that plugin to clean things up. I think that's a pretty good sell right there. Yeah. Awesome. There's a, a question from Ferris in, in the chat as well. Um, yeah. would a, uh, what would you recommend for someone that wants to learn? She says, would a coding tutorial help with understanding database cleanup? If so, do you have a recommendation? Well, I, you got to understand the, the database first. So I would definitely in, install a local environment. I like XAMPP. There's so many different local environments you can use but you got to get a local environment, install WordPress, install WooCommerce, put in some plugins, look at the database. These local environments come with PHP my admin that give you a UI into your database and click through, look through the tables, look through the columns. 
If you know any SQL queries, you can run them. If you don't, you can just use the GUI to click around and look and see what's there. And when you actually see the data uh, in front of you, then, then you'll understand it. Seeing is believing, right? Awesome. All right, so as we wrap up here, what's next? I know you've, you mentioned you got WordCamp Los Angeles. Uh, tell us what you got coming up in terms of your meetups or any other, any other information you want to share. Yeah, I, I, we, don't, we don't have a scheduled meetup date, but I know I will be presenting again on the storefront theme uh, probably sometime in October. We haven't set a date for it yet. And then the West Valley group, um, yeah, we just we haven't scheduled anything lately. I guess Andrew and I have both been fairly busy. Uh, August is always a busy month uh, in this industry. It usually starts calming down November, December. Awesome. Uh, well, thanks again. October thanks again too. for a great presentation. Always interesting. When I hear you speak, it's like it, it's like the advanced level that I need to work towards. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so it's, thanks, it's always great. It's always great information. So thanks again. Well, look at it this way. You handle politics better than me. Remember what did I say earlier? Oh, I just fire them or get another job. Right. That's, that's my answer. But I think you can handle the, you, you know, that, that end of it better than I can. So I, I, I'll give you credit in, in those areas where I know I'm not so good. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. So thanks so much. Um, if uh, anyone else has uh, any announcements or anything they want to mention, um, I know uh, WordPress Accessibility Day is coming up on October uh, 3rd. I know WordCamp Los Angeles is mid-month October. I think it's 17th and 18th. Um, and I think there's a few other uh, WordCamps coming up also. So those are some great, great opportunities to get some free learning under your belt. Um, there's a lot of great meetups. So I know we've got one coming up on video in WordPress um, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we're going to have Johnny Dow. He spoke at WordCamp Los, uh, Santa Clarita. Uh, he's a, a film producer, film director, and he's a WordPress advocate. So uh, we're going to have a panel where you can uh, come in, check out uh, what they have to say about um, leveraging YouTube or, or video on your WordPress site. So that's going to be interesting. Again, we try to bring in as many diverse and interesting speakers as possible on any kind of topic. So if you do have a topic you'd like for us to talk about, uh, just shoot me a message or drop a, a comment on our meetup. So if there aren't any other comments or questions for Sean or the group in general, uh, we, can, we can sign off here. So I'll open it up one last time and then we'll sign off. All right. Well, Santa, uh, San Fernando going. Valley has a hands-on accessibility in two weeks also. Oh, tell us about uh, what's, what's going to be, you're going to have a speaker or how's it going to work? Well, no, this is our hands-on day. It's our let's virtually do accessibility. This is for everyone to show up with their accessibility questions and problems and let's work in the moment to resolve them. The last couple meetings, Ron has been great at presenting a couple of topics relating to compliance and accessibility. He did all descriptions one week. Last time he did keyboard accessibility. So we kind of stick with what the topic is that's most important to everybody and see if we can provide answers on the sites they're working on. Oh, awesome. And, and again, accessibility is such an important topic and you're leading the way. So awesome. So make sure you check out. And I think Jennifer popped in their meetup. Yeah, the meetup link is a couple links back. I think you shared that. So make sure you jump in and check that out. We'll see you next time. Have a good evening, everyone. See ya. Thank you, chat. Thank right. you. Thanks again, Thanks, Sean. Joe. Thanks, Sean. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, Thank Sean. Joe. Thank you, Sean. So, Thank Joe. Me. Take care. Bye. Great, great talk, Sean. I, love, I liked it. Thanks. Thank yeah. you. Really good. Bye.